After reflecting on the last five decades, I've come to realize that I have a story, one of my music and my sound, and the marvelous collaborations with friends and colleagues. With a little help from these friends, I will share with you the journey that has shaped my musical life. I suppose every musician has a story, and my story is not new, but it is mine. Welcome to The Path Taken, hosted by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick. Good evening, folks. This is another episode of The Path Taken. I am Alton Riddick and Tom Farley, the star of the show. Hello, everybody. How are you doing, sir? Doing great, man. It's good to see you. Always good to see you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we're going to talk about something that I think is a culmination in a live performance of all of your work to that point. Now, what year did this recording happen? It happened uh, in September of 2016, but the album didn't come out till uh, shoot, maybe uh, eight or nine months later. It took a while to engineer it, for sure. So if I remember right, y'all didn't really get together a lot. Y'all had like one rehearsal, one real rehearsal? Yeah, it, uh, that's what makes this band so special. Um, we, we got together, uh, I think it was, uh, the concert was on a Saturday night. And so we got together on Sunday of the you know, the previous week. And uh, Richard, who was uh, going to be playing bass, but also uh, was supplying the sound and the, and the sound man, David Holden, and all the rest of that, he wanted to get a handle on the monitor mix, which I thought was a brilliant idea. So we, we set up, I was living at the Cosmopolitan, so we set up in the, uh, you know, the community, you know, room that they have down by the pool. Got, uh, got everybody there, and uh, we had two and a half hours to go over 18 songs, which doesn't leave you a whole lot of time. I mean, because a lot of that was tweaking this or that as far as the engineering was concerned. Uh, you know, it was, it was a bare bones setup, but at least we had a handle on the monitors before we went into the club, which is a big deal because if the monitors suck, then the whole thing is going to fall apart. And everybody knew that. So uh, Richard was smart in doing that. Uh, and so we had that time to practice. That was the first time all of us had met in any one place ever. And then what, five, six days later, we're on stage doing this thing live and in color in front of a crowd of about 225 people at the, at Steel Pier Cafe. So it, yeah, there was, I mean, I sent them tapes, not tapes, but, you know, CDs with the songs on them and, and a, what I consider to be a sketchy outline as, to, okay, so, so-and-so will take this lead first, then the next and the next, so forth. And on, uh, for this song, we're only going to have two or three people on stage, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, in terms of the actual performance, one time, one shot, you know, everybody on stage, just uh, that one time, that one night. Okay, and I asked that question because I felt like it was an important part and ingredient to this whole thing. And it kind of sets the tone for it because I remember you saying that and I was like, I didn't say anything to you then, I don't think, because you were kind of, you're in the groove and you're telling me the story. But I was thinking to myself, like, I find that quite amazing. So do I. <laughs> and that lets me know, that let me know how good y'all were because for not for a band to perform that well with songs they don't know and people they don't play with on a regular basis i i was impressed oh so was i i mean i was caught up in the moment like everybody else but there are certain things that i started recognizing as the evening went on um and of course i i set up a video camera you know it was in one spot it was not in the best spot to set it up but i set up this video camera and uh after watching the videos you know, of the live performance, I was able to see how they were communicating with each other, which I was unable to do because I was a front man. And, of course, it was, I had my eyes on the crowd most of the time. Uh, so they were enjoying the hell out of it. I mean, you could tell there was, a, there was an instantaneous connection. You know, they, they, were, they were having fun. It sounded good. Everybody on stage knew it sounded good. And a lot of it had to do with the monitors actually coming through. But the, the main sound was fine. That, that, that main sound would not be the, the album sound, but it was getting out to the crowd really well. David Holding did a hell of a job, you know, getting a handle on this one-time only situation and giving the crowd a good sound to enjoy. But the performances, I mean, everybody, 
Yeah, it's amazing how it came out that well. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, um, uh, well, first of all, every single one of these people has spent time in the studio with me, you know, working on one song or one project or another. And you know as well as I do that that the demeanor and the professional aspect and the, and the whole idea of, uh, you know, performance aspect of it uh, is different in a studio than it is live. There's a certain amount of respect going on. There's a certain amount of, uh, you know, uh, of, of timing and, and, and so forth that people are keyed into if they know what the hell they're doing. And every single person on that stage knew exactly what the hell they were doing. They had studio time. Uh, some of them had their own albums. I mean, you know, Ken has his own album. Uh, uh, Richard had his own album. Uh, Joanna had her own album. Pete had recorded with his group. And Donnie had recorded with with me and with with uh, Herndon. I mean, you know, there was a lot of studio and stage experience. I think on the web page I mentioned there's over 300 years of studio and stage experience on that stage. So yeah, the fact that we could actually come together with for the very first time playing these songs and the fact that they were my originals really just made it. You know, that was the icing on the cake. But I mean, to, to actually pull them off with the, with the quality and the skill and the timing and the communication and the fun that we had was, it, 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 it stunned the hell out of me. The more I got into engineering it, the more excited and the more happy I got with, the, with what was going on. So now that we set the tone for that, people understand exactly, you know, from a human resources standpoint, from a player standpoint, you know, and their expertise, the stage is set. So we're gonna go backwards. So my question to you, the first one, I have many questions, but the first one is where and when did the idea come from and what was your final vision before its execution? So where were you sitting? What were you doing when you're like, because you, because based on what I know of you, you hadn't, you had kind of retired from live performance. That's true. And so you had all this space where you weren't really working, you know, each weekend or whatever it is, like, you know, a lot of your peers, and it's like, so where did this idea come from? What were you doing? Like, I mean, hey, I want to put together a band and have a live album. I mean, what happened? Well, I mean, you know, a lot of the people who basically were on the album um, uh, were you know, in the studio, uh, basically uh, the By the Fence and the Sun album. So everybody was on that album. And, you know, in the course of doing it, you know, you talk about the songs and the tracks they put down. And eventually, you know, you come around and say, man, I look forward to, to one day being able to do this live, you know? Uh, that would be so cool to be able to just get out there and have some fun doing these songs. Well, after the album came out, and, and, and it was successful in terms of sales and, and exposure and all the rest of that kind of stuff, I started thinking that, you know, maybe, uh, maybe this could be actually be a reality. But there were a lot of things that had to fall into place. Um, I, I think that they were all up for it because... You know, they had that experience of playing with each other, uh, you know, in the studio. That, well, they didn't play with each other in the studio, but they heard what they were able to accomplish in the studio. Uh, and so to do it live, that just kind of, you know, well, let's reiterate this thing. Let's make sure we set it in stone and let people know that this is for real. So, uh, but the first place, uh, the first thing to do was to find a place that could actually, you know, handle the band. I mean, the, the people that I that I wanted to be in the higher G Acoustics band were the exact people who showed up. Uh, but the thing is, is that that's eight people on stage. And there weren't that many places I played in that I knew what the room was like, uh, where I really felt comfortable about, you know, getting in and doing it. So I went in to uh, talk to the manager of uh, uh, Steel Pier, uh, gave him the pitch. Uh, and and the, the bottom line was, was finding a, a, not only a place, but also a date a date that we could, we could lock in, I mean, write out a little contract saying, I want this particular date, you know, for this particular concert, you know, the time and so forth, all those things. Uh, and Steel Pier ended up being perfect in terms of the, the, the size of the stage. Uh, uh, Richard had worked the room before. I had worked it before. I think uh, uh, maybe uh, Ken had worked it before. So it was pretty comfortable, you know, in terms of uh, placing everybody. Uh, it wasn't the optimum situation, but for what we were going to do, it, it seemed to be perfect. So, you know, Steel Pier was it. So now that I had Steel Pier, it was a matter of, okay, let's contact these people. See, and, and I had a date, September 17th, and see if they could, act, that was like six or eight months, you know, ahead, you know, so to speak. 
And uh, so that gave them plenty of time. It was, their schedules were not crowded at, in September. So they set the date, and it was set in stone. And then I created this, the, the CDs, which I sent out to everybody, which were either live Tom Farley band versions of the songs like Fade Away and, uh, you know, um, Baby Can I Hold You, uh, even Slow Drivers, things like that. I, I would give them album versions. Uh, but other things, uh, you know, uh, were, were going to be our first take moments uh, that we would have, like the I'll Remember uh, with Donnie and Pete and, you know, Tip of the Hat with Joanna. Those would be just us, you know. It wouldn't be a full band situation. Landslide with Tanya. So at the end of the day, it was, um, I, I sent them, I, I told them the date. Everybody was happy with that date. Um, and I sent them the CD. So they had the CDs for about four or five months before we actually got on, I had the chance to get together and is kind of, you know, let's get our signal straight anyway and set up to get the monitor sound right. So, so it was planned and, and I knew that everybody was going to be there. So, and the more, the closer it got, the more excited I, I became because, you know, what a hell of a group of people to work with. I mean, they're just, they're spectacular. So, um, you know, that's that's the way, that was the first step to do it. Okay. Well, the, this vision that you had is obviously about relationships. And it, and if anybody knows you, your whole life is about relationships. Yeah, you're true about that. That's for, that's for sure. So run it down. I mean, tell us about the relationship you had with the members of this particular band for this one-time thing. Well, I, I, I consider not only the relationships, but also the musical expertise of each one of those people that, that fit perfectly. Um, Donnie Satterwhite. We go back, you know, to, to 1980, 81, actually before then, to actually the late 70s, playing with the Herndon Edwards Band. And Donnie uh, played on the Songsmith album, and like I said, played on every single album since. But Donnie has this, this, this creative sense about him, which is just uncanny. Uh, uh, I, pedal steel was what he played most on, even though on the songs with album, he played pedal steel and piano and banjo and Moog synthesizer. He was all over the place. And, and so we started off creatively in the studio and we had played, uh, you know, at different gigs with Herndon Edwards and we had a, a great relationship. So Donnie was, Donnie had to be there just like all the rest of them. They, he had to be there. Uh, so, and he was, he was, he was definitely into it. As a matter of fact, it, after the concert was over, he came up and gave me a hug and said, man, thank you for having me along for this one. And I said, I said, Donnie, I can't even imagine what it would be like without you. So it, it worked out perfectly. It was a great playing experience for, for the both of us. Now, Pete, Pete had been with, with me off and on and, and, uh, with Cam, as far as playing in bands, uh, you know, he played in, you know, for years off and on sitting in with, uh, cause he was going to school at the time. Uh, sitting in with me and Cam and Tanya uh, with the Tom Farley Cam Head Band. And later on, he did the same thing with Jerry with the Tom Farley Band. He had a, a tremendous, you know, we have a tremendous rapport personally, but also there's a longevity of performance experience. However, it wasn't until By the Fence in the Sun that I actually got Pete in the studio. I don't know what the, what the deal was. I, I, it could be because he moved to D.C. and we kind of, uh, you know, musically lost uh, connection. But, you know, the connection's always there. It, it, it's just that we didn't have a chance to play all that much. Uh, so at the end of the day, Pete, you know, had to have percussion in there outside of drums. And Pete was perfect. He knew me. He knows my music. He knows my originals. And he actually played on the album. So he had, you know, he had ownership in a lot of the stuff that we were going to be doing. So having Pete along was perfect. Uh, Greg Weichel. <laughs> what a guy. I mean, you know, we've talked about Greg before. Um, Greg is, is, is just a, a masterful, you know, player and, and just a really good guy. I can remember, um, when we were in the studio, uh, doing some of the stuff for this, uh, you know, I think it was uh, mental map blues or something where at the end of it, I, we kind of look and say, you know, I doing this thing live would be really, really a lot of fun somewhere down the line. And I said, I looked at him. I just pardon my French, but I said, yeah. So one of these days we're going to get on stage and have ourselves some fucking fun. And so right before we started, <laughs> I can remember this. He's standing right beside me on my right. And I looked over at him. I said, man, you ready to have some fucking fun? And he had the shit eating grin on his face. And I knew what it was going to be like. He was ready. You know, he he's a great player anyway and plays so many different genres. But he knew these songs. Uh, so at least certainly the ones that he played on. 
And he took that, like all the others, he took the time to listen uh, to the arrangements and knew, knew exactly what, uh, what, what timing uh, was as far as him coming in, uh, taking a lead, doing rhythm, whatever. So he was perfect choice for electric guitar. Um, Ken McNeil. It, it, you know, I played an awful lot with, with a lot of good drummers. I played with my brother-in-law, Steve, who was an excellent drummer. But to tell you the truth, uh, Ken has a style and, and an ease of, of, you know, working with that that's really pretty uncanny. He's been down the road. He, he's been on the road. Yeah, uh, went on the road for many years. He's he has that road experience. He has studio experience. He has uh, two, uh, actually three albums of his own, uh, and he loves you know the whole idea of a really really good uh, collection of musicians. He saw I, I told him who was going to be there, and he was on board immediately. Uh, plus, I knew that I could depend upon Ken. I mean, you know, the rhythm section had to be rock solid. I knew I could depend on Ken to make it that way. I mean, being a rhythm guitarist and having Pete there and you know, eventually Richard on bass, I knew that that we could actually have a, a, an uncanny rhythm section. You know, he said that he would be on board. That was great. The unique thing about having Tanya there was the fact that Tanya had not performed live anywhere. Even maybe she might have sat in on a song when I was playing solo, you know, somewhere around the year 2000 or something. But from 1996 to 2016, she did not have one minute on stage. She came in 20 years after the fact, cold, into that performance and kicked some serious ass. I mean, her lead vocals, her harmonies, I mean, it's like, you know, she had never left. And, you know, we're doing this, you know, we're doing this in our mid-60s. It's like, you know, a lot of people would have hung it up and said, screw that. We had the energy behind this band just, you know, age didn't matter, <laughs> you know, and she was right there. She was right there. And she she was having she had a couple of medical issues that she was dealing with, but she tossed them to the side because she wanted to do this for me and she wanted to be a part of this band. She knew who was going to be there and she knew it was going to be fun. So, you know, that was, you know, that was Oh, so special to see her right off, you know, right off my left, so to speak. Uh, Richard Spano, Richard and I had had, uh, you know, gotten together. He used to sit in with me and Joanna a couple times at the the Daily Grind. Uh, I knew him from his his album, uh, and also from public performances. He plays around town, was sitting in with a lot of people. He sat in on uh, and did bass for me on uh, "You Ain't Never," which ended up being a great bass track. It really was good. He also uh, has uh, his business was running sound for people and um, also, uh, you know, playing bass. But he also had the extra added attraction of being able to record the tracks digitally, uh, which means, uh, you know, he would provide me with the raw material that I could take back to the studio and actually create the album. Like I said, David Holding, uh, who was a sound man, who's not pictured on the album pictures, did an amazing job of providing a really well-rounded sound to the crowd, but the sound that I wanted uh, uh, that I wanted the crowd to always remember was the one I would generate in the studio. And Richard gave me that. He provided the sound system uh, and also provided the recorded tracks, which I would chop up and uh, you know put into their prospective songs and engineer and, and put out later on. So, but his his bass performance was incredible. He was really on that night. Uh, it was a it was a good evening, and uh, it was the best bass that he had ever played in any live situation that he and I had ever been in. That's for sure, um, at least by my opinion. Uh, that's a Joanna Benford. What a gal! I mean, you know, Joanna, uh, classically trained, uh, has her own group. Uh, you know, uh, sat in uh, for over two years with Tommy Emmanuel. She's got she's got a resume as long as your arm of, of incredible nationally known and internationally known groups that she has sat in and been part of the orchestra and backing them or uh, uh, endless road strings are, is the four part uh, string uh, quartet that she's in. They're absolutely fabulous. They've done uh, their own album, but they also became known for doing backup work for tons of, of great artists out of Nashville. So she has she brings uh, that special, I guess you could say. Uh, not only the sound of her viola, but also there she has a, a, a really a great way of translating her feelings into her instrument. And so there, were, there, were, there was a special, uh, I guess you could say, uh, feel that she added to it, which most people would not get. Most people would get like a, a standard fiddle player that would you know do country licks and stuff like that. That is not what Joanna does. And I'm 
glad for that because basically it gave it gave the songs a really unique character and a really, really full sound. Plus, the viola really goes well with the other acoustic instruments that are there. And, you know, I met her through her husband, Stephen. Uh, he works at Wesleyan. So at the end of the day, we, there's a long history of, of all these people, whether it be musical or personal, that all came together um, uh, to, to make this happen. As a matter of fact, uh, when, when I actually put the, the, the band out online, I didn't put it like, you know, Tom Farley, the High Energy Acoustics Band. I put it out there. When you're looking for it on, on Spotify or, or YouTube or whatever, you have to type in the High Energy Acoustics Band. If you type in Tom Farley, it might come up, you know, with the collection of stuff. But the thing is, on Spotify, you don't type in the High Energy Acoustics Band, you're not getting to this album. It's a, it's a unique, I, I consider it to be a unique um, uh, event and a u- unique product in every single stretch of the imagination. So I wanted to keep it that way. So uh, that's the way it was promoted. That's the way I put it out there. And I, I really like that. It, it is it is certainly a culmination of a lot of my work. But, uh, you know, that's a very unique band. Uh, you know, one time, first take, you got to love them. <laughs> you got to love this band. That's all there is to it. I started to ramble. I'm sorry. No, that's what we're here for. I wanted to, I wanted people to understand exactly who they're seeing. They, they obviously know you, but they don't really know everybody on the stage. Now, if you listen to, you know, some of the path taken, well, actually all the path taken, and, you know, some of the SIVA cast, each, some of those people have their own. So they're kind of telling their own story. So if you want to hear more about these people, uh, you know, go listen to those. But I wanted to make sure that, if this is your first time hearing anything that we do podcast wise, that you understood who was on the stage backing you up and playing these songs. Cause it's important because again, this whole thing was about relationships musically and personal. That's true. You're absolutely right. And you know, I've, I've been thinking about this, uh, you know, and trying to find, trying to see exactly what, what it could be. I, I mean, I even talked to Joanna about, it, you know, that uh, uh, maybe musicians have that, you know, all of a sudden you get eight people together on stage and and the magic just happens and everything comes off sounding absolutely incredible and everybody's timing and everybody's fun. I mean, everything works. And she said, you know, uh, she said that has happened to her, but she has had been played. She has played with, you know, uh, with bands that are nationally and internationally owned and crashed and burned, you know, uh, and so, and plus they had, uh, when she plays with them, she has sheet music, right? So at the end of the day, uh, you know, this could have been an incredibly, you know, weird experience. But there are two things that I believe that really made this stand out uh, in, in the best possible way. First of all, um, there was a great collection of songs on this on this particular album. I mean, there we we played eighteen. I was only able to salvage nine of them, but for one reason or another. But those nine, those are nine pieces of great performance quality and. Uh, the songs, they're mine, except for two of them. And uh, they, it, people had different measures of experience with the songs, but uh, some of them, like something like Pimpmobile, uh, there were only, what, three people, uh, uh, Donnie and, and Pete and Tanya were the only ones on stage that had ever had any experience playing Pimpmobile, you know, live and in color. And the re- everybody else, I mean, you know, just jumped right on the bandwagon and bam, there it was. You know they love playing these songs. They're they're good songs. So if you have good material to work with, uh, that that really really helps. Um, but also, when you take a look at the picture of these musicians and uh, and know that their their histories and so forth, the one and I say this all the time. I'm going to say it again. The one thing these people did that night, they didn't come in there to get drunk. They didn't come in there to pick up somebody and get laid. They didn't come in there, you know, to socialize and, you know, drink and smoke and all the rest of it. They came to serve the song. I mean, that's what they did. And they did it with joy. They did it with fun. They did it with energy. Uh, and we came together as a group um, immediately. You know, that's that's the that's the great thing about it. Uh, you, when you when you're in rehearsal and you got this that and the other, uh, you take this lead that that lead. Uh, this has to be held down by you. Uh, you know, I, I'll give you a cue on this that kind of thing. Those are the kinds of things that you know, kind of structure it together. But it, it, it you know it, the proof's in the pudding in terms of when it comes out and people are actually playing it. 
And they, you know, they were right on top of it. Uh, the rhythm section knew every single nuance that they had to know. A lot of that has to go with Ken and Pete. Um, uh, uh, certainly, I knew what, what the hell was going on with my part. But, you know, Richard was new on that. And he, he, he stepped right up to the plate. He did a great job. So, uh, so at the end of the day, there was a solid foundation for everybody to work on. But, you know, they really did serve the song, uh, every single one of the songs, very, very well. Uh, and that's a true testament to them. And I, I'm honored that in the fact that they actually, you know, took the time and, and made that happen for my original music.
Damn. Well, that's a great segue because now I want to talk about the music a little bit. And so for me and for any fan of yours, all of these songs are familiar to me. All of them are. So that's not really the real question, but from a performance standpoint and for people that you're playing with, the people that, you know, we just, you know, you just talked about, and you know, everything. Um, did you give the band some freedom or, you know, because these songs have aged and I know sometimes if you're the writer of these songs, they age with you too. And you might have some different ideas of how you want things played. Um, did you give them some freedom based on that age or, you know, was it a combination of the, the two, the two things happening? That's a great question. And the answer is yes, they had complete total creative license. Um, I mean, I knew what these people could do in the moment. I mean, I had sat there, you know, with uh, the mixing board and everything computer on recording these people. I mean, I, when they came into the studio, all I said was, you know, I need a guitar track or I need a pedal steel track, or I, I need, I need a little something in here. They they came with something in mind, you know, at, when they came into the studio. And I trusted them to do what, you know, to serve the song there. Why in the world wouldn't I trust them to serve the song when we got on stage? They, I, The only thing that we actually had as a, uh, I want it done this way or that was, okay, uh, Joanna will take the first lead, you know, uh, Pete, uh, uh, Greg will take the second one and Donnie will take the third. That's the only thing. And if they wondered, you know, when am I supposed to come in? I just look over and nod at them and boom, they were off and running. So at, uh, that that was the only, I guess you could say, implied structure that we had during the entire performance. Uh, Ken was great on, on, the, on the starting cues and also on the ending cues. Uh, we communicated really, really well as far as when to end the songs and stuff like that. Or if, if, if there was... Uh, uh, a decidedly album version ending that uh, Ken knew exactly what it was. I mean, you know, uh, some of the songs uh, like Slow Drivers or Jody Lee Carroll or something like that, the endings are not normal. I mean, they're, they're normal, but, you know, they're, they're kind of abrupt and you really have to be on the, t they were right there. I mean, boom, they were right there. So uh, I let them, you know, I let them have fun and play what they, I let them do what they were good at. You know, why yeah, it. I I did that in the studio. Why in the world wouldn't I do that in a performance situation too? Uh, I think it also lends to uh, itself to a considerable, not only a considerable amount of fun, but a considerable amount of respect, because they knew what was going on too. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of them knew a little bit better than I did because they, you know they could sit back and actually see things better. Uh, I I really revel in the fact of watching uh, uh, Ken and Pete you know, do their uh, percussion connection and also uh, uh, Ken and, and um, Richard, you know, bass player and drummer, you know, the connections that they made and how good everybody felt uh, at the end of each one of the songs when they when it actually ended and the, the crowd, the crowd felt it too. So, I mean, uh, their creative license has always been a part of the way I like to work with them. I trust them. I mean, they're great musicians and they're creative beyond, beyond belief. So, why not let them just do their do their thing, and, um, and it'll come out just fine. I felt like that's probably going to be the answer, but I just wanted to make sure that I asked you that because, you know, some musicians, you know, that's my baby. You're going to play it this way. That's it. Oh, I understand. Yeah, I felt like, you know, especially with Joanna, because you're listening to it, and some of the original tracks don't have her on that. And so you're listening to it, and you go, okay, okay. She was impressive. Yeah, she was, I, you know, and um, she was that way in the studio, too. I mean, she came in with an idea about what she wanted to, to play. And also, she knows she knows a little something. I mean, most of the time when she played for the big dogs, uh, she had sheet music in front of her. Well, this is a pretty raw, out there, rock and roll and acoustic rock band. And, you know, it's like, okay, it's me, Joanna, out there playing with these guys. Uh, there are moments that she had uh, uh, in, these, in the stuff that we did together but also, uh, well, you know, little things like in, in Pitmobile, she had the first lead. And at the end of that lead, she had this trill, you know, that 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 literally segued right into the next instrument. And after after, after that, and the next instrument was Donnie. And then as soon as Donnie was finished, she did it again, which segued into Greg. And then right at the end of the second vocal chorus, she did it again, which segued in, into the... Uh, uh, the instrumental, you know, take out of the song. 
and it was perfect. It was absolutely perfect. And you don't get that kind of perfection, that that sense of a place of being uh, out of nowhere. She had been played with a lot of people and she knew, uh, you know, she felt, you know, that that her that transitioning from her part to the next part would be easier just by putting that little descending trill in there. And it, w- it was absolutely fucking awesome. You know, so there are moments like that from Joanna, but also from other people as well. Uh, you know, people... Uh, I've I've seen bands play live where people have a hard time backing off, like lead players who have to play lead all the time. Uh, not these people. You know, these people know when to when to when to do light stuff, when to do rhythm, when to do lead. They know exactly when to come in because they're they're really into the moment. They feel the song and they they listen to each other, and they also have the professional experience of being able to communicate with each other. A look can do amazing things on stage. Just like, you know, okay, I'm, I'm going to be finished at the end of this measure. Take over. And you don't have to say that. Just give them the look. And they know exactly what you mean. So there was a lot of that going on. I, like I said, I wasn't able to see that until I saw the videos afterwards. But at the end of the day, that that just, uh, that's what having good professional and creative people around you is all about. Now, they know what the hell they're doing. I hear that. Like I said, great performance. A great performance from all y'all. But, you know, again, she's not on the older stuff. So to hear her interpretation of what was happening oh yeah Uh, absolutely i mean you know and it gave a flavor uh to to the songs that uh i think makes them you know they might have been around for for 40 years but it it gives them a fresh interpretation and lets people know that you know you don't have to have uh just the instruments that were on the original recording you can toss in some other stuff and and really make a great song out of it yes sir so for me i am always intrigued by the recording of a live record and all the things that go into making a a live records really sound good. So my first question is how difficult is it? First of all, how difficult is it to have good sound when you're playing out period? And the second question, there's got two parts to it. The second part of that is, is the prep different when you know you're going to record this? Um, Both good questions. Uh, First of all, in terms of the actual, um, prepping for the 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 uh, to set up the equipment uh richard uh set up the pa i paid him to actually run the uh, to set up the sound and have the sound run for us he he is very much an acoustic oriented guy he plays electric but he's a very acoustic oriented guy he also knew uh, the things that would be driving uh this recording he knew that my rhythm guitar was a major part of, of the rhythm section in this he knew that uh that ken's drums uh were going to be there and he also knew that his bass was going to be there uh, so basically he had to set up a, a full range that would be able to handle, you know, uh, the, the, the full range of sounds that were going to be on stage. And he picked the right speakers, uh, and certainly uh, picked the right uh, sound man and, and the right gear. But also, um, uh, Richard was able to, uh, the, one of the great things about it was he was able, the way it worked out was he took all the inputs from all the instruments and all the vocals and first ran them through his digital recorder 16 channels worth of stuff uh each like my guitar had a channel my vocal had a channel so forth and so on for everybody all the way down the road and so we had 16 different channels of instruments going into the recorder to record the digital tracks the output for those tracks went to the board for david holding to actually mix them into the room so the critical factor was number one making sure that the signal the digital signal for each one of the players was at maximum, but wasn't, uh, you know, what wasn't, uh, you know, uh, peaking out, you know, didn't have any distortion, uh, didn't have any uh, feedback, that kind of thing. In other words, to, to actually get that squared away that way, uh, which is very, very important. Uh, so I needed to have strong, clean tracks to work with. And to tell you the truth, the only, uh, uh, Richard did a hell of a job with that. He really did. Um, there was only one instrument that that we didn't spend enough time on, and in the end result, because of the band has such a full sound, did not really cut through, and I wasn't able to use it, was Greg's mandolin. It's just like, you know, it just, for some reason, we just never got a handle on that the way that we should. And that was, you know, that was sad in a way, but then again, his electric guitar came through like gangbusters. And so it, basically, you know, the the main instrument that he was going to be working with uh, Richard did a hell of a job making sure that it was there and had presence and, and the tone and stuff. So that setting that up that way, um, 
uh, was uh, was a real plus because, at, like I said earlier, at the end of the day, Richard would take those digital tracks, send them to me, and I would create the album. And, and, and so at the end of the day, microphone placement, that was critical. I mean, what about Ken's mics? Could they? How close could they be to the bass uh, speaker? I mean, do you have, in a live situation, we're not separated by panels. There's a lot of overbleed. And and when you're when you get into the engineering down the road, you have to really balance things out uh, sometimes to uh, to eliminate uh, you know too much of this or too much of that because it bleeds into another person's microphone. Well, Richard did a good job of setting up the mics for Ken's drums, for my acoustic guitar, for all the instruments for that matter. A lot of the stuff was direct, but you know for uh, for my acoustic guitar and Greg's electric guitar and his bass guitar. Uh, those were all mic'd things. Donnie's, uh, I think we did, no, we did, a, Donnie's uh, pedal steel was also mic'd. So at the end of the day, we had a lot going on. Uh, Pete's, you know, Pete's stuff was, was mic'd as well. So at the end of the day, Richard had experience with that before, but also not having to worry about the monitors, you know, going in because we already had, you know, 75, 80% of the monitor issues already dealt with in our practice session. He was able to concentrate on making sure that the main PA and everything was set up and that his digital recorder was able to get those individual tracks uh, it, with the strength and the clarity that was needed, um, which is a, a true testament to, to his skill in terms of recording that stuff on stage. That, that to me, was, was a biggie. As far as did it have any effect, it didn't have any effect on anybody. I mean, basically... Um, Richie, you can see in the videos, uh, Richard sometimes will, will, will talk to David about turning up this monitor or, or this, that, or the other. Uh, they've worked be together before, so he can do that without interfering with his performance. Uh, but in, in terms of just tweaking it here and there, uh, that was the only thing. It was more of a, of a technical issue as, a, as opposed to a performance issue. People knew we were being recorded. They didn't care. They'd been recorded before. They had recorded with me before. You know, so why not Why not trust in the fact that we're going to get a good recording out of it and Tom will do a good mixing job when he engineers it at home? Well, that leads to the mix. Because in my world, there's so, so much control. People, you know, they're in a booth, they're in their closet, they're, you know, each instrument is recorded, you know, by itself or it's a sample or it's, a you know, something running direct or a synthesizer or whatever it is. So I wouldn't begin to understand how to achieve a good mix with live tracks. So... What is that like to do, and what was your approach? Well, uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, the first thing I had to do, uh, uh, the way the digital recorder recorded, it recorded everything, uh, like all the songs that we did, all 18 songs, like uh, my acoustic guitar, that one track had 18 songs on it. Okay, so basically I had to chop each one of the songs out, each one of the instruments for each one of the songs, I had to chop them out, put them into their own song, right? Their, their own part, their own song in the DAW, and then make sure that they're synced right, that the tracks are, you know, uh, you know, that the timings and everything and all the tracks were there. And once I got that, then I could start. That took a long time just to do that because, you know, there's, uh, there's little nuances. And, and, and in a live performance, it's not like you got a click track or, or something like that. The bottom line is, is that, you know, I had to make sure that the timings were you know, exactly right. And, but these people had cues that they, that they worked on, that they actually put in there, uh, things that, uh, that, you know, when they came in for their lead part or when they took off on a, on some kind of percussive part, uh, that they had those and I could key on those to make sure that the tracks lined up. Uh, second of all, once the tracks got lined up, I had to actually just listen to them cold to see, okay. Uh, you know, uh, each one of them, I, 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 Tried to see it, it, where the bleed over was, because there's going to be bleed over, certainly through the vocal mics. I, I, I chose the uh, Bayer M500 for, for our vocal mics because they're ribbon mics, and they're, they you have to be right on top of them to, to really get a, a really good vocal sound out of them. But they, they also don't pick up a lot of the surrounding noise. Uh, so they're great in terms of you know feedback and stuff like that. You don't have any issues like that with them. So basically, uh, that picking up everything behind the mics really didn't um, really didn't happen that way in terms of uh, a vocal overbleed. But the, it, like the overhanging uh, mics for the uh, for the drums and the percussion stuff, you know, they they picked up a little bit of everything. So the only way that I could actually deal with that 
uh, was, you know, I could deal with it a little bit with separation. But, you know, I, I, I wanted to have the bottom end for my guitar, uh, you know, shine through, not like a bass, but would have that acoustic guitar bottom end action happening. But also, I wanted to make sure that uh, Ridger's bass came through. So how? So I had to trim off, you know, or work with the EQs of the bass on both of those so they would blend and one would not be like totally overbearing in terms of, you know, just the sound of it all. And I had to do that for every single instrument. Figure out the best way to EQ it, at th that particular track to get the absolute most out of it and then start, you know, giving and taking and tweaking so that they all could come together because you know as well as I do, the end result is to create a sound. And I want that. I, I the more I got into it, the more the whole aspect of a sound really started to to come alive. Um, the first song we actually did on, on the on the in the performance was "Over the Falls," even though it wasn't the first song on the album. I did that so so Donnie and Pete and Greg and and Ken and me and uh, uh, Richard, which are basically the rhythm section uh, for the band. So David holding out front could have a chance to get us mixed in right. You know, we really didn't have a big chance to go out and actually do sound tests and play, you know, uh, so David could actually mix us, you know, in the afternoon before we did the performance. We didn't have a lot of that at all. David just really got a hold of it pretty pretty quickly and did a, did a great job in the room. So at the end of the day, uh, getting him the chance to actually just get those raw, that raw rhythm foundation. And, you know, got a couple of leads with, uh, with, with uh, Greg and Donnie. But, you know, to get that squared away, to get my vocal squared away. Once he got my vocal squared away, he only had to add in one other vocal, and that was Tanya's. And, you know, and he only had to add in one other instrument, which would have been Joanna's. So, you know, as, and we added those in, you know, I added Tanya's vocal first, and then Joanna would join us, you know, uh, later. So 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 that was built that way to allow David to do the engineering and also allow Richard to get the get the input uh, you know the clipping aspects of each one of the channels that, that he was digitally recording to get that squared away too, which is important. So by the time the whole band actually got all the pieces got out there, uh, everybody had a handle on what was going on, and so with you know with with panning and and volumes and EQs and. I didn't didn't do a whole lot of uh, like reverb and stuff like that. Uh, maybe a little bit of reverb on the vocals, but not a whole lot of stuff like that going on. A uh, little bit of compression on on the bass, a uh, little bit of compression on the kick drum, but not a whole shitload of 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 really you know uh, techno maneuvering. Uh, it was mostly uh, tweaking uh, in terms of feel. And I, I worked uh, doing it through the headphones for, you know, the first couple, three months. And then for the rest of the time, I did it through the speakers, uh, which, you know, usually it doesn't take me that long to translate uh, from headphones to speakers. But the speakers, once I put it on speakers, it really made a big difference in how each one of those instruments was going to blend together to make a really good band sound and allow, you know, each one of the solos to, to come through, to allow the vocals, you know, to come through, to cut through an eight-piece band. So, um you know, uh, that was uh, very much a part of, of a learning curve for me. But once I got into it, started with the simple songs and then got into something else, uh, more, I guess you could say, uh, complicated or uh, certainly uh, more moving parts, uh, it worked out really, really well, uh, it, it, you know, as far as a finished product.
to you i mean somebody gives me live tracks and i start sweating bullets i'm like i'm like i wouldn't know where to begin because ble- bleed for me is one thing when it's just a drum kit but when it's like everybody yeah <laughs> that, that's that's a little bit of a problem i'm like okay but i have to understand i have to understand my expectations can't be the same expectations i have for you know studio recorded tracks and that's that's the kind of the thing i've never had to deal with and i wanted to ask you that question because i thought because when I heard it, I, I, you know, I listened to it again to make sure I was prepared doing this, you know, doing this podcast. And I was like, that was my first. I was like, OK, it sounds live, but these these instruments have some punch. And I'm kind of like there was something that had to be done to, you know, to achieve that punch. You just can't, you know, take the live tracks and just put them out there and say you mixed it. That's not how it goes. That's right. It's not how it goes. But, you know, the beautiful thing about it, Alton is the fact that, you know, I didn't have to worry about, I'd say 95% of the time, I did not have to worry about two musicians, two lead musicians like Joanna or or Donnie or Greg. I did not have to worry about them stepping on each other. In other words, both of them playing leads at the same time. Right. They knew exactly who was supposed to be in control, and they they took their, their basic background or rhythm parts, you know, uh, while the other person was actually doing their solos. So and that that that's part of the problem. You know, you get a whole bunch of people playing a whole bunch of stuff, and it, it's very difficult to separate that because hell, it's live. It's picked up on another mic. You know, it, you, it's going to be there, and, and it'll sound really crappy if you try and and you know EQ it out or or volume it out. That that you'll lose the whole total sound of what you're doing. So you know that you know. But the great thing about it was was that I actually had. That's 2016. I'm retired. I actually had the time, and yeah, you have to listen to it a thousand times. There's no doubt about it. A lot of people would find that to be incredibly boring or hard to do. Not me, because I, you know, I would, I would do something. I would, I would work on a on a song. Then I, I, I set it aside and work on another song and come back to it in two or three days. You know, and 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 here, you know, did I actually do what I thought I was going to do? And if I didn't, I'd make it better. Uh, so you know, having them knowing when to take cues, when to do it. Uh, when, uh, how to pan them uh, in the in the overall process was also uh, a really big big deal in terms of making sure that um, that they could uh, they could be heard. It's not just volume and effects. I mean, you know, their placement in the mix is just as important as their placement on stage as a live band. 
So, um, uh, yeah, but I had the time to actually sit back and uh, structure all of that the way that I wanted to. By the time I got to Pimpmobile, which was the last song that I did, I, you know, the more I got into that song, the more excited I became because all these parts started coming out. These, these, these moments that I knew by that time, I knew how to engineer them to, to actually make a difference uh, to the point of, uh, of not only just a good rock, rock and roll band sound, but uh, to, to allow every single instrument, every single person in that particular song had a really, really great part to play. Uh, it's almost like they, they have been playing it a hundred times. You know, and, and that that's the that's the time we actually recorded. Well, it was the first and only time they had ever fucking played that song, you know, certainly together as a band. And, <laughs> you know, what can you say? I mean, they, they just uh, maybe like I mentioned earlier, maybe this is, you know, just the way it is with them on a on a on a daily play by play basis. Uh, not for me. Uh, uh you know, so to get a performance like this out of most of the bands that I played with, we would have had to have played, you know, for quite some time. And, you know, to make sure all the nuances and the mix and all the rest of that kind of stuff was exactly the way it should be. Uh, this was, you know, just live and in color. And so, so, but, you know, those, those particular engineering aspects were made easy by the fact that these people knew when to take their cues or cued off of each other. Uh, they didn't need me to tell them when to play on, on a lot of the stuff. So, uh, you know, uh, having good people to work with, it goes, always goes back to that. Yes, it does. Okay, now this is the part for me, as the interviewer, where I have my favorite songs. Am I the interviewee? You are. <laughs> you absolutely are. You're the star. <laughs> so I, I had three, and, uh, you know, Fade away. Well, now that I know this, I kind of it's kind of a funny question because I thought it was the first one, you know, that y I thought this was the song y'all led with. So I'm going to treat it that way because for me, as the audience, you know, purchasing your uh, purchasing your music, that's the first wrong. That's the first. Uh, that's the first song. Oh yeah. So it kind of had this Fleetwood Mac feel to it in the beginning, and then you cut our heads off. So what was it like for you? Like you had the one rehearsal. It wasn't a lot of preparation going on. It's like, this is the precipice, right? So you're sitting there right before you hit the first chord. And it's like, what is it like to start out? Now, you know, you've, you've jumped off. And so y'all killed it. What was it like? What was it like to know that this is going to be a good night? What is that like? Well, I, the reason why I put uh, Fade Away first instead of Over the Falls is because I wanted to introduce everybody in the band on the first song. I didn't want to build up and add, add and subtract people as we went along because that was, that was what was going on the entire evening. I wanted to have a song uh, that all of us could, uh, could really, um, I guess you could say, um, uh, you could hear all of us doing our thing right from the get-go. Well, the... Um, Fade Away was the perfect choice because uh, out of all the songs that we did in the entire evening, the one song that everybody uh, in that band had played with another band was Fade Away. Everybody knew the song. I, I had given them the uh, Tom Farley Camhead, uh, not, not for Tom Farley Camhead, but the Tom Farley Band version with me, Tanya, and Jerry, the way that we did it. And I didn't give them the Bodine's cut. I gave them our cut because those were the vocals that they were going to be listening to minus Jerry, and I wanted them to get just exactly what the feel was going to be. Well, since every, like Greg knew how to start the song because he had played the song before. Uh, Joanna had uh, had uh, played the song, but only, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, and with me at the, at the coffee shop and stuff like that, never in a full band situation. But she also knew that, uh, that basically this was going to be a, a, a bring it together kind of thing. Everybody didn't start at the same time. If you notice, uh, Joanna doesn't come in until the instrumental break between the first and second verse. She comes in and boy, that sets a tone because she came out of nowhere and all of a sudden, oh, we got this to listen to as well. It was going to be perfect. And uh, so we went, uh, we, you know, Tiny and I had the vocals nailed. I mean, every single syllable, we had sung the same way for, for decades. And so we knew that song. That was a comfortable song for us to do. And, uh, uh, you know, 
it, it, it was just the perfect one to lead the album off on because it uh, in the video I made for that uh, on YouTube, that is the song that I used to introduce the band because basically, you know, it has uh, it has moments where Tiny and I are singing. Then it has uh, moments, you know, for the lead parts that each one of those people has a chance to shine uh, in the video in terms of uh, montage pictures and stuff like that. So people are going to be able to see the, who's playing the parts. Uh, it was just, a, I thought, the best choice for for actually launching uh, the actual web version of the album. Uh, and, and it worked out great.
Thank you. That's a sweat test if never was. Well, the next one I really liked was Over the Falls, which I'm familiar with. Okay, I'm familiar with all of them, but Over the Falls, I'm familiar with, but it felt a little different. Uh, so for me, a great live performance will do that to a song, whether it's aged or not. And so what are you thinking at this point? Are you are you liking what you're hearing? And see, I don't know where this fell in the performance because, like I said, as a as a you know a customer or somebody that listens to, you know, your music online, you know, it, it falls in a certain place in the, in the set list. So at this point, wherever you played the song, what are you thinking? Or like, is, you know, is the, is this the vision that you realized for yourself when you thought about doing it? Yeah, it is. I mean, um, like I mentioned earlier, we, we did this song so that David, uh, holding would have a chance to, uh, uh, to, to, to get the, the levels and so forth, uh, and the effects and stuff for EQs for all the, the basic rhythm section instruments um, and provide a good foundation for the rest of the evening that was going to go on. But um, over the falls itself, uh, that's something that is, is a basic kind of blues tune. It was a solo vocal, so it was easier to, to handle the vocal aspect of it. But also, Tanya, <laughs> before we would even went into that, while we were prepping for the, for the concert in the six months leading up to it, she said, you know, she said... Um, uh, I mentioned this before in one of our earlier podcasts. Over the Falls sounds an awful lot like uh, Mental Map Blues. And she was right. The chord structure, uh, uh, the key was the same. Uh, of course, Mental Map Blues is an instrumental. So what we were able to do, I sent them I sent them uh, on the CD to prepare. I sent them Mental Map Blues from the Over the Falls album, but I also sent them Over the Falls from the uh, uh, Over the Falls album. So they would be able to hear exactly what I was looking for. I mean, Greg could play his uh, his um, uh, uh, mental map blues uh, licks, whether they be rhythm or lead stuff in there. It provides a a really good context uh, for uh, just it's not what you call your normal blues tune. Um, uh, I'm strumming my acoustic guitar and most of the chords I'm hitting are not your standard blues you know chords, but it is a, a, a kind of a an acoustic blues song, so to speak. And, you know, having instead of having, uh, you know, uh, somebody with a, a, a Gibson or a Telecaster screaming on their slide lead. I had Donnie doing the slide lead, which is a pedal steel sound, which adds a completely different tone to what normally we would be considered an acoustic blues song. Uh, so, you know, that uh, that in and of itself uh, offered up all kinds of really nice uh, playing moments. Um, I, I, I felt it coming together uh, probably after the first three or four measures. Everything just kind of fell in. Uh, it's almost like uh, everybody was uh, knew what the song was going to be, but all of a sudden, bam, there it was. And it just took off and it was very, very comfortable. Uh, sometimes I think I made it uh, a little bit too long by letting the lead parts go on, but I was just enjoying the hell out of the leads that uh, Greg and Donnie were doing. And so I said, you know, I'm just going to go with it. You know, why, you know, be so structured when these guys are actually performing really, really well and uh, everybody's having a good time. It gives David a little bit more time to work with the sound. So it just worked out great. Well, the last one for me, number three, is one of my all-time favorites, 69 Pimp Mobile. Now, I mean, the title alone makes it a great song. Yeah, it does. But it's a really, really good song. So, and, and actually, you know, you captured it. I think for me, this is one of the ones where, you know, you hear it on a studio recording, it's one thing. But when you hear it live, it's something else. It's the same song, but it's something else. So my question to you is, and this is something I've been wanting to ask you for a while. When you wrote this song, how long did it take you to memorize those words? That's a lot of words. Uh, I don't know. I, I The song was written in one sitting. It took me about an hour to write. Um, and... Uh, it was just this vision that just, you know, that this thing that, that as far as the melody, everything just kind of came together. You know, the muses were good to me that day. Um, but uh, that song in and of itself uh, it has a ton of lyrics to actually remember. But I, I can tell you one thing. There are two people who sing that song, actually three, who sing, who have sung that song with us before and who really love that and know exactly the, the, the exact syllabic timing of every single word in that song and that's uh jerry and cam 
Cam because he was the guy who actually played on the on the studio version of it uh, way back in 82. And Jerry, because we performed the hell out of it with the Tom Farley band for many, many years. So, I mean, you know, so they that whole thing has a great history to it. Um, uh, but as a song, I mean, th- it's a fun song to play, for one thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a great song to play. But also, when you listen to the vocals, Tony and I singing on that, we do not skip a single beat. We are in time, lock time. It's like we're marching, but it's not a march song. Every single syllable, every single emphasis on every syllable is exactly the way it has always been, you know, when we sing that song. And, uh, yeah, we're missing the third harmony, but it didn't matter. I mean, you know, when it comes right down to it, as we mentioned before in other podcasts, when Tom, when we have three-part harmony, two of those three parts are Tanya and I. So, and, and they blend without the third, whether it be, a, you know, somebody usually skying out over our two parts. So we had that down pat. It was just a, make, a matter of making sure that our vocals could cut through, and they did. Uh, in terms of uh, playing the lead parts and the transitions that, that Joanna provided, uh, Donnie Satterwhite, okay, was played the, the rock and roll piano on 69 Pimpmobile, the album version, back in 82. He is well familiar with that song. Pete has played it, you know, a hundred times with us on stage with the, with Cam or with Jerry. Um uh, of course, me and Tanya knew it. The rest of them didn't have a clue. But, man, they uh, they they were caught up in the moment just like uh, the rest of us were and s- just said, we're going to have some fun. <laughs> you know, this is going to be fun. I think uh, one of the, the things about the song that really gets to me is uh, the um, the middle part where it, it, the red leather roof and the bottom is black. Everybody is locked time there. I mean, that is very rare. It's incredibly rare to have that kind of timing and that kind of precision and that kind of power that 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 part actually has. They were right there. I mean, they were everybody was boom right there. And at the end, when uh, um, uh, after uh, basically uh, when when Joanna does the trill, which takes us into the instrumental section that takes the song out, there is a there is a power there uh, that uh, just really uh, is really something else. Uh, it, 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 I, there was nobody really taking a lead. It was almost like the rhythm section was running. Uh, but also, uh, when, when I say, take it, Greg, uh, he, he does a really great, incredible lead, but when he gets out of his lead and Donnie cuts in, that is when Richard really steps up. I mean, Richard said in, in there, you know, doing some great shit along the way, but some of the best licks he had in that song were in that instrumental section, uh, taking the song out. His bass was wonderful. And that, that's the reason why um, at the end of the song, you know, uh, I say thank you. And I just go, damn. I mean, you know, I, I, I can't believe we actually did it. And it came off that well. And it had so much fun and had the kind of energy. Uh, that's why I saved it for last uh, to do, because I knew it was probably going to be the song that that was just really going to be off the charts energy and and. Uh, I wanted to make sure I had every aspect of the live mix down before I got into it. Okay. Well, two more questions. Um, this is personal. This is, has nothing to do with, it has everything to do with you, but nothing to do with, uh, you know, what we're actually talking about, but then it does. So you're looking into your left 69 pit mobile has come to an end. And so has your career with your wife. Yep. How are you feeling? Feeling good. I mean, you know, I think that there might be some time, um, you know, where there might be a chance for a performance here or there or something like that. Uh, I don't see anybody stepping forward saying, hey, I got a boatload of money. Let's make, let's pull the high energy acoustics band back together again and, and have ourselves another evening of fun. That would be great. I think it would sound absolutely awesome. And we could add, you know, a lot. I made some mistakes. Like for like I did Mangy Dog Blues as a solo. Well, I, it didn't really come across as good as it did, like in the library when I did a solo there. Um, that's a song that would have to be done with the full band. I think the full band would have kicked ass with that song. So, I mean, little things like that, plus there, there are other songs that have come in. Um, you know, I, I'd love to have this band along with a keyboard player, maybe Stevie on a string uh, ensemble keyboard uh, as well, and uh, like a, a black church choir in the background, uh, singing free me with me, would that kick ass or what? I mean, you know, that kind of thing, uh, you know, 
I don't see it happening, but the opportunity comes. I, I would do what I could to, to make sure I was up for it, and I think these people would be up for it too. I've talked to Greg Weichel and Donnie uh, uh, about it. You know, They said they love the band. We'll love to see the band get back together uh, You know, for another performance. Uh, they, they realized what the hell was going on there too. But in terms of uh, actually, you know, I've I've come become really comfortable with the fact that you know if I'm going to go out, um, I'm going to go out with a bang and not a whimper. Uh, that this this concert that uh, is the is a, I mean you can see things in videos and stuff like that, that I have on my YouTube channel, but this is a is this is an actual concert performance that really shows what these songs and uh and these people could do in a live situation how many people actually have that you know uh how many people i mean and how many people you know uh were lucky enough to have the skill set to be able to engineer it themselves you know that kind of thing to actually not have to worry about you know leaving it up to an engineer to create the sound that they feel i wanted to create the sound that that sound that i wanted to have and so doing it um as a as a final swan song, so to speak, I don't think I could have gotten a better swan song than this album. I mean, I'm still making albums. I mean, we got Renaissance Man. I got another one that's going to be uh, should be finished as soon as I can get Donnie and Greg into this uh, into the studio. Uh, you know, so there's all kinds of stuff that that are that are remaining in terms of recordings. But as far as live performance, uh, I don't think. I might be coming out on a limb and people might say I'm full of shit, but I think this is the best live album to ever come out of Southeast Virginia. I do. And, and when you look at those people, I look at the picture of those people who were in this band, they are all very well-respected musicians. There's not a bum in the bunch. I mean, people around this area know these folks and uh, know exactly how good they are because they played with them. You know, they've had them in their bands. They know exactly what an asset they are and how really good, uh, you know, when you get these kind of people together, how the possibilities of what might come out of it or what might come out of it did come out of it. And uh, I, I, shit, man, I got it on tape. I got it on video. I mean, and I was able at that particular time, it's almost like it all came together at the right time. I was, I actually had my engineering skill set ready even though I'd never done a, a live band, you know, album, I was ready for the challenge because I had the skill sets, I had the gear, uh, and um, uh, like I said, it took uh, took almost a year to get it out, but uh, whew, man, turned out okay.
answered all the questions I had <laughs> because I was going to ask you, did you have any closing <laughs> thoughts, but you already put it down. So that works. Well, I, 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 sometimes I go off the deep end, man, but I, you know, to, to this day, um, I can't, you know, the, the, you talk about Pitmobile. I don't care what anybody says. I played Pitmobile with scores of musicians, but that without a doubt is the best live version of Pitmobile ever. I mean, you know, I played with Cam. I, you know, uh, you know, he did the album version. And the album version is wonderful. Tanya's version of "Baby Can I Hold You" and the way that that band actually presented that. Her vocal performance was great, but that band knew exactly, you know, what to do. I didn't have to tell, you know, Greg to take the lead. I didn't have to tell Donnie to to put, you know, pedal steel accents on her vocal moves. It's like they knew how they knew that stuff right from the get go. They did not have to be told. They did that because they knew that was the best thing to serve the song and actually serve her vocal performance. You know, so it's nice. You know, it, it could have it could have been, you know, the biggest bomb that, that, that it could have ever been. But, you know, with these people, no fucking way. This was going to be a great performance. And the people who were there, they they got you know a real treat. I, I can look over here to my left, and I still have uh, the painting. Uh, uh, it's actually a print that, of David Edwards that was the actual picture for the album. I had it blown up, and the people who were there in the audience signed it before they left. Uh, so I'd have uh, you know a little memory of of the people who were there, and uh, they had a good time. You could tell from their response, you know, from the songs that they had a great time that evening. And I've spoken to a few of them since, and. Um, they look at me differently now, you know, after, after the, you know, after listening to the album, uh, not, but actually being there, uh, especially with the fact that most people, I mentioned it before, I don't want to belabor the point, but most people would not even have attempted that much less had the success with that in their sixties. Uh, most people have hung up their guitars or stored away their keyboards or, Whatever the case might be, by the time that and we were, we kicked some serious ass. We were, we were, you know, that was a, a very energetic and very professional and very good, you know, uh, I guess you could say picture of what we are and what we could do live, and to have that as the last uh, live performance statement, so to speak, I'm very proud of that. Smallest things, all the verses to songs she sing. Till the time came when everything faded away. Now I think, as her favorite son, is this a battle that can be won? Will I recall doing it after it's done? Will I remember the way we dance? Will I remember our first romance? Will I remember the dresses you wear? The color of your hair? Will I remember the life we made? Will I remember the price we paid? Will I remember that look in your eyes? Moments I've never had 
Names and faces that drive me mad Just a bit more scary than before I'll keep trying to get it right Try and get me some sleep at night And hold on till I can't hold on anymore But I'll remember the way we dance I'll remember our first romance I'll remember the dresses you wear The color of your hair I'll remember the life we made All the beauty, the price we paid I'll remember that look in your eyes And I'll remember my reply I'll remember that look in your eyes And I'll remember Well, Tom, that is it, sir. I appreciate this uh, this gift you gave us. I, it's it's a great record. And if anybody listening to this wants to know about it, just go to farleymusicandart.com and check it out. It's it's a great piece. If you if you have one shot to kind of understand who this guy is, this is probably probably the best representation. Now you can listen to all of them, but I'm just saying, if you had one one record to listen to, this is probably a good one to start with. If you're a YouTube fan, not to get too, uh, uh, you know, merchandising, uh, merchandising. But if you're a YouTube fan, uh, basically, I have um, uh, YouTube videos, mostly montages, uh, for every almost every single one of the songs in the album. Uh, so you can go to YouTube, uh, you know, uh, just type in Tom Farley YouTube. And once you get past the the guy who's the uh, chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, who always has about ten guys, ten postings in front of mine. When you get to that, you'll you can uh, 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 when you get to the the actual uh, YouTube uh, channel that I have, um, you can check out the live uh, uh, the, the YouTube videos if you're a YouTube person. Uh, one thing I wanted to also say um, uh, before we left, the videos themselves. Um, uh, I didn't use uh, any, uh, even in the, the videos where they show the live performance, I did not use any of the actual video camera uh, in the room audio for that. What I did was I took the videos, uh, the actual players playing, and then took the actual engineered album version of that song and stripped the old, stripped the live video and put the studio, you know, generated uh, album uh audio in there i mean it's just, it's the same stuff everybody's playing the same thing uh but it's it's the sound that i wanted people to actually hear it's not the live room sound uh live room sound was great but it's not you know a live album studio sound which is that is the sound that i want to be remembered and also it has all the parts uh being played uh with the with the volumes and and the and the total sound of the band the way that i wanted to so uh, thank you, David Holding, for giving us a good room sound. Uh, that also allowed me to experiment with, uh, with video a little bit more and um, provide that, that quality of, of uh, video presentation when they go to YouTube. Well, this has been a great episode. Uh, I am Alton Riddick, and for Tom Farley, we appreciate your listening. We'll see you next time on The Path Taken. Thank you, brother. Thank you. This episode was produced by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick, edited and mixed by Alton Riddick for Edit Your Truth. On behalf of Tom, this is Alton signing off until we meet again on The Path Taken. Mm-hmm.